This is London's New York. In today's episode, we're going to go to a couple of places that are really the opposite of tourist attractions. Because generally, when you're visiting a city, you want to see the places in it that are beautiful, inspiring, places that make you feel good to be in them. And New York is full of beautiful places, among them some genuinely lovely buildings. But today, we're going to visit two buildings that are really quite terrible. They happen to be across the street from each other, built within a couple of decades of each other, and built for the same purpose, to house parts of the city government. And they share a particular kind of terribleness, one that says a lot about who we were as a city at the time they were built. So where where are we right now? So right now we're in City Hall Park uh, near the uh, northeast portion of it. And we're surrounded by all of these big white uh, marble neoclassical buildings. And this is where a lot of the municipal uh, functions are headquartered in New York, where you have the surrogates court, the municipal bureaucracy, the um, Board of Education, the City Hall itself, where the mayor and city council resides. And um, around the corner is uh, Foley Square, where the Supreme Court and whatnot is headquartered. So it's this where I come a lot because uh, one of the buildings here, the surrogate court, is where I do a lot of my uh, archival research. It's where the city's mayor, the mayoral papers are located uh, in, you know, hundreds and hundreds of microfilm. It's where the city hall library is, where any number of the departmental records are. And this is our first ugly building the Surrogates Court, also known as the Hall of Records. It was built in the late 1800s with the intention of it being New York's City Hall. And particularly when you go inside, it's a building that's really, well, it's weird. New York's original City Hall, uh, it's sort of colonial era City Hall, was built on Wall Street. And it's where, uh, you know, George Washington got sworn in as president, yada, yada. Is that the Federal Hall? Federal, it's, it, well, Federal Hall is the site of the old City Hall, yeah. Um, a new City Hall was built in 1811 in the neoclassical style. And by the late 19th century, New Yorkers felt, you know, the city's going hugely, we need a much more impressive City Hall. And this was supposed to be the new city hall, and this really gives you a sense of what their ambitions for the city were. It's this grand, oversized, um, with sort of pretensions for civility and aping European styles of architecture, but it's a really unique structure. I mean, from the outside, it's this French Beaux-Arts, big mansard roof, decorative sculpture everywhere. On the inside, though, there's this crazy, Egyptian motifs that are going all around here. And like they're pharaohs, there's like uh, signs of the zodiac, I'm guessing. Um, it's a really interesting choice. It doesn't match at all with the rest of the architecture here. Signs of the zodiac with their names written in Greek. Yeah. And then um, right below it, above some of these entrance doors, there's a couple of illustrations of some Dutch looking folk pouring over maps. So these are the original New Amsterdam colonialists, um, sort of referencing earlier forms of government in the city. And then what I love over here, uh, I mean, there's actually two things. On the side we're facing to the um, west, there's an allegorical sculpture. And uh, it says, let's see. What, what? Can you read what that says? Recording. The Purchase of Manhattan Island. Recording The Purchase of Manhattan Island. 1626. Right, so that's when it's the typical legend of New York being bought for $24 by the Dutch. But it's a very innocent and pastoral image of what was, in fact, you know, absolute exploitation and brutality. But you have on the right a noble, savage looking Native American. Uh, on With a tastefully placed, looks like a tobacco leaf. Tastefully, on his, yeah. Over his. Uh, And on the left, you have a generic uh, white Anglo, not Anglo-Saxon, I guess, Dutch um, woman. Though I gotta say, she kind of looks more classical Greek than anything else. Classical, classical Greek, yeah. 
Um, and then in the middle is the nice cherub of civilization, heaven, uh, approving of this transaction. And on the left and the right, you have uh, the fasci, the axe uh, surrounded by the bundle of sticks, which represents unity. Later on, the fascists in uh, Europe would, of course, use that as their symbol. Um, so here's your classic uh, racist, you know, allegorical sculpture from the time the structure was built uh, shortly after amalgamation in 1898. And this style of interior design, which is to say everything all at once and all of it kind of uncomfortable, continues as you move from the foyer into the central hall, which is basically a gigantic stairwell. Uh, Maybe just describe what yeah, you're saying. I mean, what you're seeing going um, through this sort of little colonnade is this open um, room with uh, a skylight above, uh, you know, sort of crisscross little um, rosettes and neoclassical decorations. Um, that's sort of uh, four stories high. Um, and then on the third row, there's another row of columns that encircle the room. And then leading down from that to your uh, left is this magnificent staircase, uh, sort of double staircase that splits uh, halfway down. And it's just this, you know, this morass of marble and rosettes and curlicues and cornices and uh, what I especially like about I like I like a good cornice. I yeah, I mean it's interesting because neoclassicism is you you see it in parks, you see it in homes, you see it in public edifices, and in some ways they all use the same vocabulary. But with something like this, you really see how the whole mood and tone can change based on these proportions and the scale of things. And here, I mean, if we go a little further in, you'll see some other changes. Everything is massive, like this giant marble double staircase like it's, it's I mean everything is the proportions are completely exaggerated I mean it's just heavy it's almost like the marble is like melting the stairs are like big yeah, lumps of volcano that are melting into the floor but yet it's all curlicues and cornices and decorated it's like it's like a it's like the, a, it's an ornamented mudslide or something yeah. like it's so heavy and dark in here what do you think someone is, is meant to feel by being in this space. I can't help but thinking, I can't quite suss out what the effect is supposed to be, and I can't help but thinking that whatever it was supposed to be, it didn't get there. Well, and maybe it would have been different if it had become the city hall. As it turns out, they kept the old city hall, and this is now just the hall of records. But when you go inside the original city hall, as I did for the first time last week, I mean, it's a completely different experience. I mean, it's like this gentleman's drawing room, uh, from the 18th century. I mean, there are these small rooms, uh, very reserved decoration. Um, there are touches of elegance and grace. I mean, there's a beautiful winding staircase as opposed to this brutal imposition over here in this, in this building. And you do get a sense that, oh, this is a friendly building. This is uh, a sort of human-scaled government, let's say. But of course, this is not meant to be that. I mean, this is a palace. It's, it's just way too much, right? It's, it's way too much. And at the same time, it's too little. I mean, it's too much architecture. There's too little um, sense of connection with bureaucracy or connection with your elected officials. I mean, what we're sort of left with is a sort of sinister... Um, like, it's not a place to linger. Like, you don't see people linger or grabbing coffee or anything here. I mean, it's, it's almost like a little panopticon or prison where there's this sort of central yard here and people have to sort of scurry around to their quarters and cells to do the work, you know. And with that, we'll move across the street from what is arguably the ugliest neoclassical interior in the city of New York to what is likely the ugliest neoclassical facade, right after this important message. Hey, podcast listeners. This is Austin, Senior Vice President of Applied Transduction and Crossfading, here at the Nautical Soundwave Research Center at Race Car Radio's Subaquatic Headquarters. We couldn't be more thrilled to tell you that London's New York is being sponsored by Audible, the world's biggest and best provider of audiobooks. And guess what? 
You, our terrestrial listeners, can get a free audiobook by signing up for a no-obligation 30-day trial by going to audibletrial.com slash LNY. While there, you can choose from any one of their amazing collection of audiobooks. Ah, looks like we're getting a call from Dan London on the book recommendation line. Hey, Dan, is that you? Yep, that's me. What book are you recommending today? Today I'm recommending The Color of Law, A Forgotten History of How Our Government Segregated America by Richard Rothstein. And it goes into how in the post-war period, the sort of modern face of inequality of white suburbs and black inner cities was formed through government regulation, particularly around insurance provisions. And so it's really an essential book for understanding the social geography of modern day America. Oh, thanks, Dan. Again, that book was The Color of Law, A Forgotten History of How Our Government Segregated America by Richard Rothstein and narrated by Adam Gruber. That's just one of an amazing collection of audiobooks that you can choose from. Just go to audibletrial.com slash LNY and you can sign up today for a 30-day trial membership. Again, that's audibletrial.com slash LNY. We are now directly across Lafayette Street from the Hall of Records, standing in front of the massive Manhattan Municipal Building, officially renamed the David N. Dinkins Manhattan Municipal Building just a few years ago. So where are we now? So now we're um, in the front of the municipal building that's uh, staring down Chambers Street, and this is the sort of penultimate symbol in New York of... um, sort of the aspirations of municipal government in the early 20th century. This was built by the firm of McKim, Mead and White, who was the premier neoclassical architects of the era. And they had designed enormous mansions. Uh, They helped design things like Columbia universities and sort of, you know, Pennsylvania station, all these grand civic infrastructure. But this was two new things for them. First, it was a government building. And second, it was a skyscraper. And McKim hated skyscrapers. I mean, they all did, the sort of old guard of uh, classical architects. And so this building, uh, from a distance, it basically looks like a bunch of, it, lo- it looks like four neoclassical buildings stacked on top of each other. It's, it's weird, right? Because it, it really does feel like the top... 20 floors have nothing to do at all architecturally with the bottom five. Like, yeah. it's just, there's this hard line. There's yeah. even a line. You can see the line, and even the stone is a little bit of a different color, actually. It's a little bit of a more gray down here, and above it's a little whiter, I guess. But um, you, you definitely can see the difference over here. I mean, if, if I had just looked at this without hearing that, I would have, I actually had thought that the top was built at a different time. Yeah. That it was an addition. Right. It's sort of like the Washington Monument, where you see very clearly when the Civil War sort of started halfway up. Or, or there's that skyscraper in Midtown that the bottom was historically... Right, and yeah. Just, they stuck a new... The Condé Nast building, yeah. But this was, this was all... This was the intention. This was the intention, yeah. And in front of what is already a kind of schizophrenic-looking building is probably its weirdest feature... You see, the two wings of the building curve around into a kind of a U-shape, and then between the ends is a false front, a straight wall supported by columns that turns the U into a capital D. This makes a strange open space between that false entrance and the real one. It's not like an open plaza, though, but they have this amazing portico, this row of columns that just sort of bridges the different wings of uh, the building. And, I mean, I'm not totally sure what they're trying to do, like what they're what they're referencing here, but it's this t- totally isolated row of columns that's just projected out from the rest of the building. Um, and then in the middle of the building, they have a roadway. Uh, and the roadway originally led right out from the Brooklyn Bridge. So you would enter this Manhattan through this huge triumphal arch and row of columns, etc. So, I mean, this is... And you actually, to come off the Brooklyn Bridge, you'd actually drive underneath yeah. the office building? Right, yeah. Well, that's just weird. And it is weird. The space we're standing in right now, it's like we're in a room with no roof. It's almost like it was a victim of a fire or something, and they they partially rebuilt. Like, there's just, it's just open, and then you see this weird thing on top of us. Yeah, no, I mean... But doesn't it look like we're supposed to be in a room right now? Or, like, under a... 
I mean, it's 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 too, under a it's, ceiling. I mean, it's too small to be a plaza, like a classic European plaza, but it's too, um, but it's it's still not like the interior of a building. I mean. It's a weird, really weird space. It's a very uncomfortable space to stand in. It yeah. makes me feel like I'm in trouble. Does yeah. it make you feel like you're about to be arrested or you've just been arrested and you're being dragged off to the gallows or something? It's, it's imposing in all the wrong ways. Yeah, no, I mean, this is really, I mean, this is not a place to uh, saunter or to hold a protest even. I mean, you feel very dominated. But I mean, don't you just, I have no reason to think this. But the whole time we've been standing here, I just have this feeling that someone's about to come over and tell us to st- to, to to move along and stop recording. Yeah, I, I mean, I'm not getting as intimidated by that as much. Um, I think it's it's more like what what are you accomplishing by standing here? Like you're like you're not seeing any of the ornamentation. They're sort of overscaled, and you need to creak your neck up. Um, it's sort of a ve- blank space. And if you step outside of this bizarre, unwelcoming entryway to a position where you can see the ornamentation on the outside of the building, it continues somewhat in the style of that front room of the Hall of Records. Strangely appropriated classical themes shoehorned onto a place that really couldn't be farther from ancient Athens. So it's a little tough to see, but um, ringing the municipal building are all of these allegorical sculptures of New York City departments, bureaucratic departments. And you'll actually see there's a tenement uh, inspector in one of them, but but garbed in neoclassical robes. There's an electricity department where you'll see this Greek person with like an electric plug sticking out. And it's one of the most amazing juxtapositions you'll find. So so each each one of these little like, it looks like the pantheon of Olympic you know, deities, each one of them is like the sewer inspector or something? Literally, like the person with water is the water department, is, yeah. Like, the, this is what all bureaucrats should aspire to. <laughs> yeah, yeah. If there's a theme here to the two buildings we've, we've looked at, it seems like, like in, in a European city, right, because they're so old, stuff gets built Kind of you build something and then it's, it's, but a lot of stuff's been there for a long time. And it's like, we had to build a grand city. We had a hundred years to build London. Mm -hmm. So you just sort of, how did you do that? I don't know. How about we try this? Like there's this this feeling of just like throwing stuff at a wall and seeing what sticks are. I mean, you just, you, you sort of reference the best models and you have, you sort of put them all together, sometimes even in the same building. Like we saw in the surrogate court, they have Egyptian motifs and neoclassical and Baroque. And these two buildings are just the beginning of Lower Manhattan's bizarre civic architecture. This whole district around City Hall Park and Foley Square just to the north is chock a block with this kind of stuff. All of it seemingly designed to give the impression of ancient, lasting, imposing power, but all of it thrown up really pretty quickly right around the turn of the 20th century. You have this sort of great, um, not exactly a traffic circle, but a traffic plaza um, that's ringed by yet more municipal buildings. The Supreme Court, uh, you have the tombs, this um, very old prison uh, that as was updated in a jazzy Art Deco style uh, in the 1920s. It's the, it's the holding cells now, right? It's where the holding cells now. It's not, it's not a current prison. And if you look actually further down the street, you can see a dome, and that's where the old police headquarters was located. Um, oh. So you really have this full um, city government. And this is located, incidentally, um, right where where the old uh, Five Points neighborhood used to be. Uh, The neighborhood, which in the 1850s and 60s was considered the sort of worst slum in New York. It's where Martin Scorsese based his movie Gangs of New York in. And it's where, as per the name, five streets uh, sort of intersected um, in this neighborhood of mostly Irish, free, some free African-American uh, working class people. And it was all swept away, all demolished beginning in the late 19th century and replaced with these 
this sort of imposing symbols of law and order. What? This was five points right here. Yeah. Wow. I had no idea. Yeah. And now, now, and now, and and they bulldozed what they considered the notorious, you know, Irish slum. Yeah. And in the place, there's this kind of horrible fake Parthenon. That's the. Uh, I guess that's the Supreme Court, right? That says that's the, right. the, the true new- administration of justice is the firmest pillar of good government. <laughs> yeah, it just rolls off the tongue. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, mean, I mean, you know, talk yeah, about law right. and order. Talk about a imposing, you know, law yeah, and order imposing, at all costs. Yeah, yeah. I, I think there's one street that's left from the original five five points, one of the original streets. Uh, and it's the one that's right south of the tombs over there. Uh, but the, yeah, the rest of it has just been uh, amalgamated into this this terrible bureaucratic uh, agora over here. You, even though we're about a block and a half away from the municipal building, its proportions are so terrible that even now we cannot see the top of it because so much of it is hidden behind these flanking wings. All you can see is this great gilded sculpture on top, Civic Virtue, um, which uh, I always say on my tours has to be cleaned every year, um, which uh, is probably not true. But, I mean, it's honored more in the breach than in the, uh, than in fidelity, I suppose. I, I gotta tell you, I've been down in this part of the city couple dozen times, different kinds of business. I've walked, I've been inside the municipal building um, to, to interview someone. And I've, you know, I've been in City Hall a bunch of times and I've never noticed that that building had a statue on top of it until right now because you can't see it from yeah. 90% of the angles. Yeah. And isn't that sort of, that actually says something. The fact that civic virtue, which is supposed to be this great symbol and inspiration for the bureaucrats of the city, is hidden from their view because uh, all the buildings around here are, you know, can't, don't have sight lines to it. So it's really hilarious. If you're far away from it, maybe if you're an ordinary ordinary citizen, you can look at it, but for the people doing the work, they have much more parochial uh, perspectives, let's say. And uh, virtue, virtue is literally obscured from yeah. their sight. Right, exactly. My name is David Hoffman, and I produce this show. With me, as always, is Daniel London. Today's episode was sponsored by Audible, where you can get the free audiobook of your choice by visiting audibletrial.com slash LNY. Never miss an episode of London's New York by subscribing to the show on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, and most of your other favorite podcast apps. You can find a lot of those links at racecarradio.com slash London's New York. That's with no apostrophe before the S. We'd love to hear your feedback on this episode and your ideas for future shows. Please come interact with the show on Facebook and Twitter at LNY Podcast and on Instagram at London's New York Podcast. London's New York is a production of Race Car Radio, www.racecarradio.com.